Okay, well, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, what we're doing right now is proving the existence of atoms and molecules. I don't know if you realize that, but uh, this is exactly what Albert Einstein wrote his PhD thesis about, and if we did this in 1926, we all would have won the Nobel Prize in Physics, um, which was great because Perrin was able to do that. Um, so these are small particles. They're about um, one one hundredth of the size of your hair, and they're being magnified over here. Um, and they're flitting about. This random motion isn't a jitter on the, on the microscope. It's actually the temperature of the room bouncing molecules off of these things in random places and making them move, which is actually a very powerful thing to observe. Not a lot of people get to see this. In, in 1824, Robert Brown uh, saw pollen grains doing this, and so he decided to uh, see if they were alive, because these things look very alive. Um, so he put them in the oven, and he cooked them, and um, pollen grains, and put them back in his microscope, and he saw exactly the same thing. And he said, this is a weird phenomenon. And it took until 1905 for Albert Einstein to put all the pieces together to say that um, the temperature of the room is actually what's doing this. The fluid that these things are suspended in, which is water, um, has molecules that bounce off of these at random places and kick them around. And so hopefully we'll use that as a way to start thinking about um, squishy materials or soft materials. Okay, so this will take a moment to, uh, to load up. Um, what I'm going to tell you about is a story today um, that I've entitled uh, Squishy Power. And so Squishy Power to me um, doesn't really mean anything um, in reality. There's no books written about it. And I'm not a philosopher and I'm not, a, I'm not somebody who makes broad statements about society. Um, I'm basically a mechanic that can do math, um, which makes me a physicist. Um, and so Squishy Power may not mean much, but my subtitle or my secondary title um, probably means a little bit less. And that is the power of soft matter. And that's um, what I'm going to discuss today. OK, so uh, we're going to do a little bit of a, a demonstration show here. And I hope that there's a piece of paper being passed around to everybody in the room. There will not be a test, although we could have a test at the end. Um, what you're going to do, actually, is not bend that piece of paper. You're going to hold it very flat and forget about it, or just put it on the floor. And we'll come back to it towards the end of the talk. You're going to make a very cool piece of soft matter. OK. so. Let's get started. Um, let's talk about the principles of TED. Um, TED is an, an amazing event. Um, this is a TEDx, of course. Um, but TED stands for something. We haven't really focused on that very much. But it stands for something really cool, and that is technology, entertainment, and design. You know, what does that mean? Well, TED is a forum. It's a way for us to um, you know, express creativity and also to talk about ideas, have, a, have some mechanism by which we talk about ideas. But I would say it's, it's, there's something hidden inside of here. There's some deeper thing. And of course, you know, mechanic that can do math, so not really a philosopher. But I think there's something hidden. Um, and I see it all the time. Uh, it turns out it's physics. Um, and so, but I'm biased. Um, I actually f see um, physics everywhere I go. This is my car. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's a problem. But that's up for my wife to decide how big of a problem that is. Anyway, so. Um, I do like physics a lot, but I want to ask a question. You know, this is a, this is, some questions will be rhetorical, but some will actually mean something um, to the crowd. So I want you to tell me, what's power? We're here in Georgetown, right? What's power mean to people at Georgetown? A word? OK, that's a good one. Wealth? Politics, maybe? Political power? Influence, right, great, OK. So political power, we're here at, um, in the hub of the US political power uh, system. Um, and I can only think of one p powerful politician that we should be talking about on Alumni Weekend, and that's class of 68 right here, number 42, um, who's had a rebirth you know, in the last couple months uh, in his political power. Um, and that's the last thing I'm going to say about anything that's, that I know very little about. Okay, So that's, um, that's what I'm going to stop at. Um, but power from a physicist perspective is slightly different. You know, I teach this stuff to undergraduates, and at the end of the day, it's kind of boring. Um, but you know, I have to do it. I have to tell you what power means from my perspective. And power from my perspective needs to be an equation, <laughs> right? Um, so definition 1.0 is uh, the rate at which work is done. You all have probably taken a mechanics course at some point in your lives. Um, and I promise this is the only equation, and so I left it very simple. Um, so the average power of a system um, is the change in work over the change in time. So if I force something, I exert some power on it. Um, 
Okay, so that's nice, but we have to be good scientists and good experimentalists, and we have to recognize our units. And so here are the units of power. This is watts, uh, like was said. Um, but no, really, it's, uh, it's actually watts. Um, so we name things like power. We give it an actual meaning. We give it a definition that we can measure. Think light bulb, right? There's lots of power being projected onto my face right now on the top of my head. Um, and you know, that, that's, uh, that's something we can measure. So what else can we measure? Well, let's think a little bit more deeply again. Again, you know, not a philosopher, but I want to talk about things. I want to talk about what makes a thing powerful. Think about the most powerful thing in your life, a thing, a tangible, something you can touch, something you can measure, something you can use. What makes a thing powerful? Well, to me, it's another definition. It's impact. How much impact does it have on your life? Things that we use every day impact us. And I'm going to show you, I think, today that a lot of the things that you may take for granted in your everyday existence, things that you don't even think about, they just come off the shelf or you buy them at the grocery store, they have power. They have impact. So let's, again, revisit TED, right? technology. Maybe this impactful thing that you can think of comes from the world of technology. Maybe it entertains you at the same time. And maybe it has some sort of flawless, beautiful, ethereal design that you really covet, right? There's only one thing I can think of that covers all those bases, and that's the new iPhone 5, right? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. For those who uh, like the droid or whatever else there is out there that I don't have any idea about, um, there is this thing, this thing. It, it has power. You probably look, if you have one of these, and I've been looking around watching people tweet and do this thing and that, you probably look at one of these things more than you look at human beings during the course of your day. It's a little bit weird how it's transformed my life. I have it right here. It's in my pocket. One of these things is right here. I cannot get away from it. It has power. So is this thing powerful? Who would say that it is? I, I would. I mean, you may not agree with me, but I think that it is a powerful object. And so let's break it down. Let's talk about what the iPhone really is. It is a set of materials, glass, aluminum, silicon, maybe a piece of uh, you know, a very hard substance that covers the, covers the, the uh, camera. It has a display. Right? The display is this beautiful thing. We look at displays all the time in our life. They're actually called a liquid crystal. A liquid crystal is a piece of soft matter. And so could we switch powerful materials with soft materials and saying these are now new and powerful ways of, of communicating or even using uh, the world around us? So I'm going to shorten it a little bit. I'm just going to call it soft matter because that's what I like to call it. I don't like to say materials too many times. So definition three, what is soft matter? It's the fundamental science of everyday materials. And I say everyday, not in the sense of mundane, but in the sense of having some impact on your life. What you saw in the beginning when I showed you those little particles flitting about, those three micron particles, you interact with those things in an intimate way every morning and hopefully every night if you listen to your dentist. They're in your toothpaste. They polish your teeth. There's what, they are what make your toothpaste work, OK? So that's a powerful little thing. You stick those in your mouth every day, I hope. So soft matter. Let's just run through some examples. Let's look at things. But let's, in a sense, step back for a moment and say there are materials at the mesoscale. And people here take the classics. They know what meso means. It's the middle, right? Middle scale. Middle scale of what? Well, the middle length scale of the world, right? So 10 to the minus 10 meters, units, is an atom. 10 to the 0 meters is roughly a meter. That's us. OK, that's, that's not me, but uh, somebody out there. Um, so what sits in the middle? The middle of the scale is stuff that I call soft matter. It's the mesoscale materials. And what I'm going to show you, I hope, is that inside of this little egg of goodness is all we need to know to understand soft matter. OK, so I have silly putty in my hand. And raise of hands, who's touched silly putty at some point? Yeah, OK, good. So silly putty, it's a bouncy ball. OK, that's pretty straightforward. What if I take my silly putty now and I change it a little bit? I let a little bit of force. I can't do this with a bouncy ball, right? I let a little bit of force, just gravity, exert itself 
on my silly putty, what happened? It dripped. It went from being this elastic solid, this ball of elastic material, to something that looks a lot like a liquid, kind of a weird liquid, but a liquid nonetheless. And so this in-between length scale is what empowers this little ball of polymer to do what it did. And so let me explain that in sort of simple ways. So you can think of the inside stuff, what we can't actually see, what we could see if we put it in a really powerful microscope, is molecular spaghetti. Think of it that way. And so molecular spaghetti, that just means that I have these wriggling little polymers, these things that are long in strand and really long, microns long, but very, very small on another scale. That is, they're really thin and really long. They're moving about. I throw it against the floor and they slap against each other. They cannot move through each other. They'd have to pass through each other, which is illegal, right? That breaks the laws of physics. But if I put a little force on them, let them do their dance, they eventually unfurl and form that dripping drop. And that's the amazing thing about the middle scale. It has this ability on time scales that are relevant to you and me, change the way the material acts. And we'll see that, I think, over and over again. And that makes them pretty powerful. OK, so soft matter. We've got a lot of them. Shaving cream, toothpaste, colloids inside of here. Do you, who likes gel toothpaste, the clear kind? I kind of like that. Who likes the pasty kind that's kind of white? OK. Gel versus paste means that your colloids are what is called index matched to the background material. They're the same. You like something that doesn't really exist. You like a lie, right? So, OK. Um, yogurt. It's milk that's been destabilized. It's colloids. Milk is fat uh, suspended in a fluid, a lot like an emulsion. There's my favorite emulsion. Uh, Hellman's mayonnaise, and I'm going to show you some pictures that have come out of our lab and some other labs of the different types of soft matter in their different guises. This is a cell, this is a crumpled sheet, this is uh, that LCD display, this is a liquid crystal, and this is blood. We are soft matter. I am a soft, softer than I used to be, piece of material, <laughs> right? There's some hard stuff in there, but it was soft at one point. It started off as collagen, which I'll talk about a little bit more. So soft matter as materials. OK, so soft matter, here's some dynamic pictures of soft matter. Um, all of these have come out of our labs here, either at Georgetown or places we've been before. Um, and so this is a cancer cell moving through a three-dimensional collagen matrix, which is kind of neat. You can come over to the lab and look at this. These are little sand grains that are just being vibrated up and down on a plate. That's it. That's all that's going on. This is an emulsion drop that's hit a fluid surface that explodes and forms this beautiful pattern. This, again, is what would have won us the Nobel Prize in 1926. Um, we wrote a little software to track these little particles around. Here's some Hellman's mayonnaise being sheared in a device. This thing is still the tenth, a tenth the size of one of your hairs. And you're watching the motion of this thing on that scale. This is a hundredth, maybe a thousandth the size of one of your hairs, these little strands. And we have very powerful microscopes that we can look at these things in real time and actually measure how they move. So back to our idea of the iPhone, right? So we've got this thing. It's made of liquid crystals. And we make liquid crystals in the lab, too. This was an undergraduate's project last summer. This is from Jana Dodson, who's in our physics department. Um, she did a really amazing job. This is what happens when you put liquid crystals like in that display, although a little bit longer. These particles are kind of ribbon-like, uh, on a droplet that's supposed to be spherical. It forms this really crazy shape. And we're still trying to understand why it does this. There's this cool interplay that goes on. Um, and so there's a little sliver slice through this thing. This is a composite shot, and these are the actual slices that we took in our three-dimensional microscope. So it's a very, very cool object. What I want you to do is the following. Take your piece of paper, hold it up. I, I need one if somebody has one. Oh, good. OK, that'll kind of work. Perfect. Great. OK, so I almost won an Ig Nobel for this, which was really satisfying. but. A friend of mine wanted anyway for the same topic. All right, so here we go. Paper. Weak. Paper's weak, right? Not powerful in this direction. I hold it by the corner, hold it by the side, it bends over. It's kind of a wimpy material, right? You can try this at home or in your seat. Right? But now, don't try this because you'll end up messing it up. I'm a trained professional. Pretty strong. Right? It's very hard to rip apart 
in this way. That's right. Because what you're trying to do is stretch the paper. Here it's bending, right? The bendy part is a wimp. The stretchy part is pretty strong. Now, everybody, please. Frustration builds in. You've taken physics class from me. You do this a lot. I have a student right there I can see smiling. <laughs> okay, so now we've got a little ball, right? Carefully, open your ball. I love that noise. Okay, now don't, un don't flatten it out. Let it, let it kind of be this thing, right? Different, very different. Your paper is now strong. You've transformed your piece of soft matter, just like I've done with the egg whites, into this really, really different type of material. Right? So we can do material science through frustration, which is the way a lot of it gets done, I think. But I think that's a, a pretty interesting way of dealing with very weird problems. And the reason it does this, the two second reason, is what you've done is you've taken the bendy parts and you made them very small. And you've mixed them with the stretchy parts, which is where the, the creases are. The creases are stretched. And they separate areas of very small, flexible parts. And so what dominates in this is exactly that stiff material. OK. So maybe I can switch and finish up. So now we've got, and I, I published a paper a few years ago on exactly this topic. Figuring out what the distribution of these ridges, of these stretchy parts, was. Uh, and it got some, got some press. It was kind of fun. OK, so last thing um, is just a movie. This, again, is this cell, this cancer cell that's moving its way through this environment. Kind of looks like a spider caught in a web. Um, but we measure the forces that these things apply. And they're really small. And they're really uh, amazing materials, in some sense, to understand. OK, so hopefully. What I've convinced you of is that squishy power isn't just some weird uh, thing. It's, it's the ability to, to look out at your world and look at the things around you and really observe them in a, in a very different way than you have in the past. Hopefully, you won't take your toothpaste for granted anymore because the stuff inside of there proved that we have atoms and molecules in the world, which is kind of cool to think about. So thank you very much.